Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending this presentation. Uh, my name is Philip, and in this talk, I'm going to tell you about a system we designed that enables app sandboxing on stock Android. Android security research has received a lot of attention in the past years. A major direction of reach the research has been monitoring and constraining untrusted applications on Android devices. And among the wide variety of solutions brought forward were dynamic permission systems, information flow control, and dual persona bring your own device solutions. However, if we classify those approaches in terms of their deployment strategy, strategy, uh, strategy, uh, strategy we can see that they divide into two categories. They are either operating system extensions that modify Android in one way or the other, or the application layer solutions, simple apps that a user can install on his regular Android device. Let's have a look at both of these categories. So here we have a very simplified view of the Android software stack. We have the Linux kernel on the bottom, the Android middleware, the system services on the left, and have a bunch of apps installed in user space. And apps use the binder IPC module to communicate with the system services or other apps. And they, use, uh, this, they issue syscalls to the kernel to communicate with the kernel. And these different entities are separated by boundaries such as the kernel boundary or process boundaries between the processes in user space. And what operating, systems extension, operating system extensions typically do, they add new reference monitors to either the system services or the Linux kernel. And the advantage of that is, is that it provides good security guarantees because these reference monitors reside behind some kind of security boundary, such as a process boundary. On the other hand, these solutions are inherently difficult to deploy because they require, require users to flash a custom firmware onto their device, which incurs data loss and is not suitable for the average user. Application layer solutions, uh, on the other hand, they're just apps that you can install uh, on a regular Android device. So these are very easy to deploy. However, Android isolates different apps that are installed on a device. So it's not possible for this monitor app here to actually see or intercept the communication of other apps on the system with the Linux kernel or the system services. So these apps can actually not enforce any security policy. They can just monitor the global system state. What research has been doing is they have addressed this problem by using a, a technique called inline reference monitoring, where they inject the monitor into the untrusted apps themselves by rewriting the apps. And these systems are still easy to deploy. They can be deployed as a regular app. However, they provide only weak security because the monitor and the app share the same process space, and the malicious app can tamper with the monitor or attack the monitor and uh, thus bypass the monitor. Also, inline reference monitors come with uh, other practical prob problems, like they uh, break the application signature, um, and they come with legal concerns regarding um, rewriting third-party code. So the current state looks like this. We have operating system extensions, which are, which are hard to deploy but provide good security, and we have application layer solutions, which can be easily deployed but only provide weak security guarantees. And what we are going for is the middle ground in between. We want to have a system that is easy to deploy and provides good security. More precisely, we, we are going for monitoring and constraining the capabilities of untrusted applications. And with easy to deploy, we mean we don't want to modify the firmware and we don't want to require root privileges. Further, we also want to refrain from modifying other applications, like inline reference monitors do. Further, we want to have a protected reference monitor, so a reference monitor that resides behind some kind of boundary, such as a process boundary. And finally, we want to have fail-safe defaults, and that means if an app is somehow able to bypass our reference monitor, we want to, it to be restricted um, to a very confined permission set such that it cannot cause any harm to the system. And in the following slides, I will, we, I will go iterati iteratively through our design process 
and uh, introduce uh, the design that we developed. So first, we want to have no firmware modification or root. So the solution to this is actually very straightforward. We are just going to have a regular app that you can install. But as we saw before, that app is not going to be able to moni monitor other apps right away. And because of our second objective, no application modification, the inline reference monitor approach that we saw before does not work in our case. So what we did is we just turned the inline reference monitor approach upside down. So instead of injecting the monitor into the untrusted application, we dynamically load untrusted applications into our monitor app. That's called application virtualization. And that works without actually changing the code of any untrusted application on the phone. So that way, we can, we can achieve our deployment objectives. We have a, a very easy to deploy solution. Now let's have a look if, how we secure that, uh, how we secure our solution. So with that, with that approach, the monitor and the untrusted app still share the same process space, so the app could still tamper with the monitor app. And what Related Work has been doing, or a very straightforward approach to this, is to actually split the monitor into two separate apps or two separate processes, where we have a privileged monitor app and a, a thin shin, shim app that is just going to host uh, the untrusted application's code. And with that, we have introduced a process boundary between the monitor and the untrusted app's code. However, that still doesn't give us fail-safe defaults. So an, a malicious application can still remove or bypass the hooks that are placed by the shim that relay all the communication through the monitor and can still directly issue syscalls or uh, initiate binder IPC to the Android system services. And one solution or one potential solution would be to have a shim app that just has zero permissions. However, it has been shown that e even a zero permission app can still do a lot of harm. It can, for example, send intents or start activity, so it could launch the browser and open a URL in the browser and that way exfiltrate, exfiltrate data even though it doesn't have uh, the internet permission. And the solution that we came up with is to use a little-known Android feature called the isolated process. The isolated process has been introduced in Android 4.1, and uh, what it does, it allows application developers to specify that certain service components within their apps should run in an isolated process that is separate from the rest of the app. And these isolated processes in particular, they don't inherit the permissions of the main app that declares the isolated process. And most importantly, these isolated processes have no access to the Android middleware. So, so they cannot send intents, they cannot start activities, they cannot bind to any services, and they cannot connect to any content providers. Also, these isolated processes run with a distinct transient user, uh, user ID. That user ID is just randomly assigned when that process starts, and with that, the isolated process does not have uh, access to the app's private directory, so it cannot write to that directory or read from it, and in fact, it cannot write anywhere on the file system. It can read world-readable files, but it cannot actually write anywhere. So with that, we, so the isolated process is actually the most restrictive runtime environment that stock Android provides. And with that, we arrive at our final design, which we call Boxify. And it even has a custom, very artistic logo with, in familiar colors. Um, so what we do is we load the untrusted apps into isolated processes. And this isolated process, or the app, the, the app in, the, in the isolated process cannot do anything. It's completely uh, restricted in its capabilities, and that also renders it completely dysfunctional. It actually does not work anymore. But with that, we, we shift the problem of restricting the capabilities of untrusted apps to gradually allowing the operation of, that, of, the, of the sandbox apps to succeed th such that it uh, works again. So we go from blacklisting to whitelisting. And the, the challenge for, for Boxify now becomes to 
actually, well, allow the, the operations initiated by the untrusted app to succeed such that it, that it can work again. And uh, we do this by splitting, the, uh, splitting our Boxify app into a privileged monitor process, which we call the broker, and one or more isolated processes called target. And let's have a look at both of these entities in more detail. Let's start with the target. So the target hosts the untrusted application code, as we have seen before. And it contains three more components, an IPC shim, the sandbox service, and the syscall shim. The purpose of the IPC shim is to di divert all binder IPC to the broker. And here we leverage the fact that all binder communication is bootstrapped through the service manager, a central service registry that hands out binder handles to other system services to the app. And by redirecting uh, the communication to the service manager to the broker by patching the binder handles to the service manager in the target uh, process memory, we can um, effectively divert all binder IPC to the broker. This gives, a, this gives us a very reliable choke point. And this technique actually works universally for all binder communication regardless of the concrete interface that we are redirecting. The syscall shim does pretty much the same thing just for system calls. And um, here we leverage the fact that applications use the standard C library to issue system calls. And we rely on a well-known technique called ELF hooking, where we override function addresses in the global offset table to point to our code instead. So we hook system calls like open and remove and make dear. So when that application calls that function, it will actually end up calling our code, and we will gen, gen just forward that call using binary IPC to the broker. The sandbox service is the, the control channel for the broker to actually load and terminate apps in the, target, in the target isolated process. So that sandbox service is tagged as an isolated process, so it basically creates that isolated process. It's, it's, uh, that's one of its, uh, one of its purposes. So um, one, of the, one of the main challenges was how do we actually load that untrusted app into our, into our isolated process? And the main or the, the, the high-level idea is that we just mimic what the system would regularly do when it loads an application. Um, yeah, and here's, uh, here's how it works in detail. So the broker first binds to the sandbox service using the regular Android bind service API, and that causes the isolated process to be started by the system, and it will bring up our sandbox service and then return a binder that allows the broker to communicate with the sandbox service. And then, then we call one of our functions that tells the target to prepare loading one of the one an untrusted, app, an untrusted application that causes the IPC shim and syscall sys shims to be set up, the hooks to be placed. And most importantly, that call returns a binder to the application's application thread, and the application thread is Android's main interface to communicate with apps. So it uses the application thread interface to deliver an intent or tell an app to start an activity. And we leverage that very same interface to tell our target process to load or bind an application, and that is a function that is provided by the Android framework, and we just give it the app uh, that we want to start, and when that call returns, the, our untrusted application is running within the target process. OK, now, now let's have a look at the broker. The broker is uh, organized into three layers, the API layer, the core logic layer, and the virtualization layer. So let's first look at the API layer. The purpose of the API layer is to establish compatibility across different Android versions. So the, the problem is that the, the structure of the IP binder IPC transactions that we intercept at the target is version specific. These in interfaces are internal to Android. They're not exposed to developers, so they change frequently between Android versions. And the, the job of the API layer is to recover the structure of those intercepted IPC uh, parcels and then translate them into a Boxify internal API. So that allows us to keep the rest of Boxify, the layers below the uh, API layer, 
um, agnostic about the concrete Android version that we are running on. The core logic layer provides baseline permission enforcement and a few virtual system services. So one problem is that from Android's point of view, all, all interactions seem to be coming from Boxify itself. Android does not have any clue that there are actually other apps running within Boxify. So Android's permission enforcement is rendered useless. So it cannot distinguish different apps. So Boxify, Boxify at the core logic layer has to re-implement that permission checking. And that's what the service policy enforcement points are for. Uh, also, the syscall policy enforcement point does what the kernel would typically do. Uh, typically do. So all apps that run within Boxify sh actually share the same home directory, namely Boxify's home directory. And the syscall policy enforcement point makes sure that apps, for example, cannot read other apps' data or cannot open sockets if they're not allowed to do so. Finally, the core services. So we, we have to re-instantiate very few uh, system services at this, at this layer. Most prominently, the pack, uh, uh, lightweight implementation of the package manager service. So we can run apps within Boxify that the system doesn't even know. So we have our own implementation of the package manager service that provides the necessary information to run these apps within Boxify. And depending on what you want to do with Boxify, you could also move other implementations of system services uh, at the, to this layer, like a mock location service, for example. Finally, let's look at the virtualization layer. And uh, the job of the virtualization layer is to translate between the Boxify world and the outside Android system. And it's kind of like a semi-transparent layer between Boxify and Android. So from the view of the sandboxed, from the inside view of the sandboxed app, it, this layer is completely transparent. The apps don't know that they are running within Boxify. From their point of view, it looks like they're running natively on Android. From Android's point of view, this layer is completely opaque, so it com hides the fact that there, is, that there are other apps hosted within Boxify. And um, this, is, this is roughly how it works. So we have an app that declares a bunch of Android components, a couple of activities, services, receivers. And if that app wants to start an activity, for example, activity A, it will issue a start activity call with that activity A argument. And that call will, will actually end up at Boxify's broker because we have redirected binder IPC. And Boxify also declares a bunch of activities like a large but fixed number of activities, services, receivers. And these are just empty shells. They're just names that we can hand out to the system. And when such a start activity call comes in, Boxify will replace that activity identifier with one of its own identifiers. Then that call is forwarded to the system. The system allocates all the necessary resources to start that activity, and then call, will call back to Boxify to actually schedule the launch of that activity. And uh, using the mapping we established on the outgoing call between the activity A and activity 1, when that call comes back in, we can substitute activity 1 with activity, oops, activity A again, and that call will then be dispatched to the application. OK, now that we have seen how Boxify works, let's look how we can actually use Boxify on an Android system. So apps have to be started through Boxify in order to run Sandboxed. And there are several ways to, to launch apps into Boxify. So one is to just have a dedicated activity that Boxify provides that kind of acts like as a replacement launcher through which you can launch other apps within Boxify. Or you could have a Boxify widget that you can place on, on, the, on your regular home screen, and this, these shortcuts can, can then automatically launch the associated applications within Boxify. Or the, maybe the most elegant solution would be to actually have Box, to register Boxify as your launcher app. And Boxify will then run whatever launcher app you, you desire, the stock launcher or any other launcher app, and we'll show that when you press the home button. But the whole launcher will be running within Boxify, so we can show the union of apps that are installed into, in Boxify and the apps that are installed in the system within that launcher. And we don't need to modify the launcher, since the launcher will request all the packages from our package manager implementation. We can give it whatever apps we would like to see in that launcher. 
And what, what's also kind of neat, it's, it's very easy to install apps into Boxify. So what we can do is we just launch an App Store app, like the Google Play Store app, within Boxify. And since that app will also talk to our package manager implementation, when we click Install, that app will automatically be installed into Boxify. And since apps don't need to be installed in the system regularly, but we just need the APK and we will load it and run it, that installation can happen without system privileges or without any user interaction with the package installer. And what's also kind of neat is that these App Store apps, like the Google Play Store, will actually take care of automatically updating all the apps that run within Boxify. From its point of view, those are just regular apps installed in the system. OK, let's look at performance. So we ran a couple of, of micro benchmarks against uh, the middleware and performed some of typical operations like open the, opening the camera or querying the contacts. And we uh, come out with a an, with an pr pretty constant overhead of, of about one millisecond, and that equates to about 1 to 12% overhead. So that's actually very reasonable. Syscalls, however, are much faster than uh, the middleware calls. So the open syscall, for example, just takes 9.5 microseconds. And, um, and the, the, we, because we introduce a new IPC round trip between the target and the broker, we incur a constant overhead of about 110 microseconds. And in absolute numbers, that overhead is not, not high. Uh, in relative numbers, we, we didn't even dare to compute them. But um, uh, so the absolute overhead is not so high. And uh, let's look at some more realistic benchmarks. Uh, in order to find out what the real slowdown would be, is uh, we, we ran a couple of benchmark tools on top of Boxify and Natively and compared the scores that they output. And we can see that the loss here is just about 5%. And also, if you like, run an app within Boxify and play around with it, you don't actually notice any slowdown. OK, let's look at some uh, of the limitations here. So one I've already mentioned we completely cancel Android's own access control checks. So Boxify needs to re-implement all that permission checking logic itself. And that's actually kind of hard to do. Um, there have been several papers that have established mappings between API calls and permissions. And th this, this information is that is, is we use that information to re-implement permission, this permission checking. But it's actually very hard to get right. And that's something that we'll have to address further when we when the development of the prototype progresses. Also, Boxify violates the principle of least privilege because we can actually host any app within Boxify. In general, Boxify should hold all the permissions there are, um, which makes it uh, the broker a very attractive attack target. However, this, this could be mitigated by um, assembling a, a use case specific Boxify instance on the device that has only assigned the permissions that are required for that particular use case. Or something that would be really nice but doesn't exist is a, is a way of dropping, selectively dropping uh, permissions at runtime. Also, um, while the interaction with the Android middleware is severely restricted by the isolated process, uh, an isolated process can still uh, communicate uh, with the kernel unconstrained. So the full kernel attack surface is available to, to, an, to an isolated process. So if there is an, a kernel exploit or some kind of root exploit, this is not something that we can defend against. Uh, this could be addressed by using something like SecComp, for example. And finally, um, uh, an untrusted application can detect the presence of Boxify. Even though Boxify is designed to be transparent to the untrusted apps, an app that really wants to find out whether it's sandbox or not will succeed in doing so. And it could, could refuse to run or behave differently when it's running within Boxify. OK, what can we actually do with this? So a lot. Um, so the, the general idea is that we can actually take a lot of the ideas that have been brought forward as operating system extensions and instantiate them within Boxify at the application layer. Um, so for example, we could have systems like more fine-grained or dynamic access control, information flow control, du dual, persona, uh, dual persona or bring your own device solutions. But you could also do stuff like dynamic analysis, automated testing. One idea is to port the exposed framework onto Boxify so that it can be used without root. So there's actually a wide range of, wide range of applications. And with that, I'll, 
I'll conclude my talk. So what, what we have presented is a lightweight application virtualization solution for stock Android that does not require root privileges, root privileges or application modification. It incurs only a low runtime performance overhead, and it opens up a wide range of applications. Thank you. Long time from Lehi. So I have a question about your threat model. Uh, so you mentioned uh, for the inline reference and monitor approach, the monitor code may be bypassed, right? So, so my understanding here, you are doing bytecode uh, level rewriting. So if you trust the type system of the bytecode, then, then the monitor code cannot be bypassed. Uh, and uh, so are you worried about maybe there are bugs in the implementation of the virtual machine? Then like memory on safety, uh, could bypass those monitor code? So we're actually not doing any bytecode rewriting. We're not rewriting any code at all. Yeah, I understand, and but I'm just trying to compare yes, your approach sure, to a sure. bytecode rewriting and, um, approach. If you, if you just assume Java code and if you trust the, the implementation of the Java virtual machine on Android, which you shouldn't, um, um, then, uh, then the in inline reference monitor approach could actually uh, be secure. but. So many apps use native code, and within the presence of native code, you cannot give any guarantees if you're doing inline reference monitoring. So with the th we assume that the application actually can tamper with all the memory within its own process space. So we trust the operating system and the, pros the, the isolated process in which, in, in which we load the untrusted application into, it it's, can be completely compromised. So the application that's running within the isolated process can do whatever it wants in its own process space. So it could also bypass an inline reference monitor. OK, because of native code, that's what you're saying. Exactly. Okay. Hi, uh, Lorenzo Cavallaro, Royal Holloway University of London. Thanks for the talk, very, very nice, interesting. So I was wondering whether you guys had any mechanism in place to avoid the target, uh, well, the untrusted app running an isolated target process to rehook itself to a, a bogus broker, for instance. Because you're doing elf hooking, so got overwrite, so uh, you're actually hooking the stubs of the system calls. So that doesn't allow, that doesn't disallow to actually um, invoke system call directly, which includes IOCPL calls, which basically creates a binder call to, to basically communicate with another process, which means that you could actually communicate with a bogus or malicious broker, which doesn't enforce any monitoring at all, although the permissions still need to be requested. Mm -hmm. So the hooks that we place uh, in the target process are not a security boundary. We, as I just mentioned with the question before, we assume that an untrusted application can actually bypass those hooks. But the fact that the untrusted application is running within an isolated process, that actually, that isolated process mechanism actually precludes uh, an untrusted app that has bypassed the hooks to bind to any other service to ac obtain any binder IPC handle that would connect it to a bogus broker. So the, the service manager or the activity manager, if the, if the isolated process directly communicates with that, bypassing our hooks, they will actually refuse to, 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 to work with that isolated process. Okay, I see. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Hi, Yan Chen from Northwestern University. A very intriguing talk. Um, I, I wonder, have you, you know, why try to compare with every writing approach? Um, so I think your approach still treats their apps as a black box because um, you don't know how their sensitive information can be transformed in the app. And when you try to do BYOD, when you try to apply the, the policy to prevent information leakage, how do you know whether this is the sensitive information one is sent out? So we don't. We, we actually don't try to classify any information that's leaving, that's coming from that app as, as sensitive or not. So far, all, all we have presented is a framework that allows you to instantiate whatever security policy we, you would like. Th that's what I'm saying. The, the policy is hard to apply for some uh, privacy leakage prevention. Mm -hmm. For example, um, how do you prevent a, pri uh, a phone number or contact being leaked? Okay, so we would have to do, do, do extra work for that, right? So we could, we could instantiate some kind of information flow system within Boxify, for example. That's something that we are, we are already working on. But so far, Boxify does not address this at all. Okay, I'm just saying, okay, maybe you can take the offline. The okay. general comments is, uh, if you don't, have, uh, don't look into the apps, you don't have anything inside the apps, 
then it's hard to infer the information being, you know, after being transformed in the app, whether it's still the sensitive or not. You know what I'm saying? Right. Okay. Yu uh, Chongsun from Penn State, very nice talk. Um, so I have a question. So many of your um, like requirements, like um, a separate isolated UID namespace, a different style system view, and different paid namespace, are actually already implemented in the kernel. So like, why do you do this all in user uh, like user space? Why not don't directly use the like the kernel features? So the the idea I here is to actually move all that. Okay, so of, of course, we, um, you're right. We, we are actually doing stuff, again, that's already present on the Android system. For example, we have to re-implement the kernel, kernel and, and middleware permission checking. But the, the idea here is to have a, 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 a user space system, an app that you can deploy on, on any device and that you can uh, enhance with any kind of policy that you would like. If you do it directly in the kernel, then, we are, then you, you have to flash a custom operating system again. And our objective was to put all this into an app. Right, but um, I'm saying like um, like the lightweight uh, virtualization support, like Linux containers, those kind of support was already in the kernel. You don't need to refresh the kernel. You also to use them, right? So why not use them to build like a lightweight sandbox for the applications? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm I'm not sh I'm not uh, sure if the, if those uh, mechanisms are available to to regular Android apps. Uh, that's certainly an interesting idea that we maybe can discuss later on. Okay, thanks. Um, something, uh, Rick Farrow. So um, it sounds like this is a nice approach. You don't have to root your phone. Um, what I was envisioning is something like an ad blocker. Is that quite possible? You could you could actually um, in inside of Boxify say, okay, these top hundred ad sites, I'm never going to visit them. That's actually something that you can absolutely do. Okay, thanks very much. I like the idea. So, I was, so, uh, um, Stefan Surio, Microsoft Research. The ad blocker, I'm just trying to understand. I, okay, great. Thank you for actually bringing this very nice trick. I, I didn't know about it uh, with, with the isolated process. But to build an ad blocker, now I have to pay that overhead on every single thing this application does just to do the ad blocker. Is, um, that, is my understanding correct? So in some sense, it's a, it's a, you know, is there a trick I can, I can do to actually just pay that overhead for the calls I care and not pay the overhead for the calls I don't care? Yes. So for binder IPC, we are actually redirecting pretty much all binder IPC through the broker. But right. for syscalls, we're actually very selective because the overhead is so high. Right. So if in, for, the, for an app blocker, we would probably just have to intercept the socket syscall, which we have to intercept anyways, because it would fail otherwise. The, uh, the isolated process would not be able to open a socket. So we have to proxy that call through the broker. But once we have given the resulting file descriptor to the isolated process, all read-write operations on that file descriptor, for example, can be performed with native speed. But, so but there is still an overhead in sort of breaking, right, this having, running, running this in the shim layer. I still have, or there's, so for the things that I'm not rewriting in the shim layer, you're saying there is zero overhead for those calls. Um, you're saying, okay, sorry. Uh, well, let's take that offline. Okay. Where can we get it? <laughs> okay. Um, so we'll definitely open source this, but we're not quite ready to, the, to release the source code because I guess no one else could build it right now. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we hope to release it within the next couple of months. And um, we'll, I'll set up a website where you can leave your email address, and then I'll send you an email when it's available. Thank you very much.